gives me real pleasure tonight for uh, to introduce Jim Ballum as our speaker. I was delighted a few months ago where Jim came up and voluntarily offered to give one of our presentations. And um, partly because I know that Jim can give an excellent talk, but partly I'm really interested in the topic of goatscaping. I don't know if any of you have a lot of have heard much about it. I have certainly heard a lot. And I was delighted when at Thurston they decided to use goats as a, a strategy there. So I'm really anxious to hear about what they learned and, and how it uh, has, has gone. Um, I should mention that Jim is one of our most valued members of the Wild Ones. He's done, he, for several times, he's offered for us to come tour his home yard. He's given us tours of Thurston Nature Center and um, where he currently serves as a volunteer steward. Um, he told me that, that it was back in 2011, I think, that your son was um, doing a project with the Nature Conservancy. And that, plus reading one of Doug Tallamy's books, convinced him that, that going more native was the thing that he should be exploring. And since that time, he's added more than 70 different species of plants in his own yard. And um, uh, I've certainly been very impressed with the work that, that he and the other stewards have been doing at Thurston Nature Center. And so please join me in welcoming Jim Ballum to give the talk tonight. Um, and one interesting thing is uh, Bob was one of the people who helped uh, get one of our first habitats going. Uh, he came out and worked with some of the uh, Thurston Elementary School kids to sow seeds and we now have a nice party as a result. So it's one of our many habitats. A uh, couple quick questions. How many of you, if anybody, has seen the goats that we had when we had them out there at Thurston? Um, three people, myself included, and my wife. <laughs> so one, per, one other person. Um, how many of you have ever thought about the possibility of using goats to help you with a project to get rid of uh, some of the bad stuff in your area? We got a couple there, so we. So you're going to learn quite a bit about what we did here, because this is going to be kind of a how-to. Not that we were experts at all, because we were absolute novices at this, but it turns out things work awfully well. So I'm going to describe the whole project from start to finish. Lots of stuff about the goats, so though. I have to have that. Um, quick uh, comments, though, about the title first. Uh, goatscaping, I don't you find that anywhere else in here. So just want to mention it's really nothing more than using goats to help you remove some vegetation from an area. And I very recently heard uh, some people at the Wisconsin DNR call it uh, prescribed grazing, which is pretty descriptive. Uh, and it also includes uh, sheep apparently. So um, I've never heard of sheepscaping, but anyway. Uh, the other point I want to make here is I'm calling this habitat rehabilitation and not restoration. And there's a reason there. Uh, there's actually a difference. And restoration means you're trying to return an area to its original state. And we definitely did not do that here. We, we did not go that far by a long shot. Rehabilitation, on the other hand, is trying to return some of the processes that a native area would have, and we did do that. Um, but we did not try to turn it to, return it to its existing condition. And I will show you in a couple slides what that was, actually. We did remove a bunch of invasives, mostly buckthorn, but other stuff as well. But we had a whole bunch of other trees in there that were not original to the site. They'd all been planted by school kids there at Thurston uh, in the last 50 or so years. So um, some pines, crab apples, and a few other things. Left all of that. And we did add native plants after we took out the bad stuff, uh, but probably nowhere near the number of species that would have been there originally. So two reasons why we, well, I'm not going to claim that we restored the area. So the agenda, I'm going to talk about the Nature Center. Uh, we are the other TNC, not uh, the Nature Conservancy. 
uh, and then the whole project from the start to finish. And uh, there'll be some Q&A at the end. I'm gonna actually start that because I have a whole bunch of Q&A. <laughs> And then I'll let you uh, jump in uh, with your own. But if in the process of this, I'm saying something and you don't understand it, or you need some clarification, jump in, you know, yell out or whatever, and I'll try to answer it there. Because if I can clarify something for you, it's probably clarifying it for the other people as well. So where are we? Uh, this isn't showing up particularly well, but um, we're in the northeast part of Ann Arbor. We can see the freeways uh, kind of surrounding that area. Despite the fact that Google Maps likes to say Thurston's over here, they've been doing that for years. And I, I have no way to, no idea how to get that out of there. Uh, we're actually right in here. And um, just below that, boy, this is not showing up in our map at all. Uh, right in here is actually Thurston Elementary School. This left-hand portion it is also owned by the schools. This is this section over here is not. That's kind of community property. And Clay Middle School is across the street up in here. This is what that area had been originally. So the entire area that is we now call Thurston Nature Center was either a wet prairie or an old tree forest, and the pond was not there at the time. Um, the, uh, it, it kind of looks like it's more wet prairie where we are, um, but the pond is there now. In between what it is now in the 1830s, which is when this uh, would have been the case, uh, it was a farm field for a while, but kind of a wet farm field in some spots. So here's a close-up, and Bob mentioned a uh, tour I gave, and this was actually the map that I used at the time, so uh, a few people might recognize this. The dark bluish line there is the route that we took, and we were mostly so following the path, path or the trail that goes all the way around the pond, with a few detours, for example, down to uh, an oak savanna that is not original. We started that in 2009 with 20 oaks. We literally just took over part of the, uh, kind of an unused part of the playground there. I think we had permission. Uh, this down in here is actually the prairie that Bob helped with, and then uh, my son cleared this area just north of it uh, in 2011. This right here is kind of the only part of the nature center that's semi-true to the 1800s. And that is a remnant of the Altikri Woods. It has, of course, been invaded by various things, mostly buckthorn. So we've been working on that for quite a while. Uh, but that's really the original part. Uh, dividing line between the public schools and uh, the Orchard Hills Athletic Association, which is uh, a pool and some land around it, that was given to the community by the builders when the whole area was built up. And that, I believe, was a requirement of the city at that time. So we're about 18 acres total, and that's everything except this little bit down here, which is still part of the playground. But that includes all this other stuff that uh, is colored. And seven acres of that is the pond. That was a farm field originally with some wet areas, especially up here. Uh, but that was created as a stormwater detention pond when the whole area was built up because with all the impervious surfaces, they needed a place for the water to go, and this was it. The school district was originally going to put the middle school right here, and at some point they decided that was probably not a good idea to try to do it over what had been a wet prairie, and so it's, uh, it's up over here instead at this point. As it stands, we have a couple inlets coming off the streets, the stormwater system along the north side, and we have an outlet here, and that is uh, the main part of the headwaters of Miller Creek now, and then that eventually goes to the Huron River. So all the ecological work here is done by uh, volunteers, and we are managed by a committee that's uh, associated with the schools 
uh, PTO, and since they are a nonprofit, so are we. So we do get donations and occasionally grants for some of our projects. And if you have ever been in eBird, uh, it is one of the hot spots in the area. And we have people who go there quite regularly, um, maybe almost weekly. There's somebody who comes by and they record all of their sightings. And there's quite a few sightings. Uh, there might be a couple of dozen species every time someone goes out there adds to that. But over time, since as, as far back as I could go, um, there's 144 species that have been in there. Our project area for the goats was down here, and on the north side was actually this trail that goes around the pond, and on the south side of this brown uh, is actually a paved path, which is the main entrance into the school area from the east side of this area here. So it's quite a long, narrow, uh, space that we picked for this. And just a plug for our Facebook page, we have uh, one person who lives nearby who's out there all the time with her camera. She takes beautiful pictures, puts them out on Facebook quite regularly. This is actually looking across the pond at our Oak Hickory Woods remnant. We do have some willows. Uh, this picture was taken actually from an outdoor amphitheater that they use uh, by the school teachers to bring their kids out there and do lessons out there fairly regularly. And here's another one of her pictures. So how did we decide to do this? Um, back in the summer of 2019, the city of Ann Arbor did try this out in Gallup Park. They had a couple of islands with bridges out there. So they just put the goats out there and closed off one of the bridges and they didn't have to put up fencing or anything like we did. Um, and then in December, they gave, uh, it wasn't a presentation, it was a discussion really, uh, at the Steward Circle. And if, for those of you who don't know what the Steward Circle is, it's a monthly get together. It's been going on more than a decade, I think, maybe a couple decades. And it's been coordinated either by NAP, the city's natural area preservation group, or the, um, pardon? Watershed Council. No, not Watershed Council. Uh, we did. Oh, they, they had it for a while too? Um, Stewardship Network. Stewardship Network, yeah. Um, so it's held once a month, and right now they're doing it at the meeting room at Vets Park uh, Ice Rink. And they publish what the topic's going to be, and anybody interested just shows up and they talk about it. And usually they have somebody there who knows a little bit about the topic, which is very handy. There's lots of people have questions, of course. Uh, in this particular one, that December, uh, the person who coordinated the project at Gallup Park for the city and the owner of the goat farm were there. So I asked lots and lots of questions, took lots of notes, and then immediately fired off an email to our nature center committee and said, I really like this idea, I'd like to try it. So in uh, the first couple months of 2020, we started talking about it, uh, decided to go forward, we had an area picked, but then what happened after that? <laughs> Lockdowns. So we had a new requirement. It had to be a spot where we could have some good social distancing. Fortunately, we had picked one that had probably the best social distancing in the whole nature center. So it was perfect. So we went ahead with the final planning in this that summer. We really did have a perfect spot. Um, and I have a list of 10 things here, believe it or not. Um, good viewing, good chance to social distance. It was a high priority to get rid of some invasives, mostly with honeysuckle, uh, excuse me, buckthorn, then honeysuckle and some of the other things. Does anybody here know what European spindle tree is? This is a euonymus. It is a euonymus. We didn't know we had it. None of us knew the name, none of us recognized it, but when the goats got in there and started clearing things, we started to see these green stalks, green spring stalks, and we thought, what the heck is this? So we had it, and you know, we now have 40 invasives in the nature center that we know of. Yeah. 
Um, clearing this area was an opportunity to open up another view of the pond, which we always like to try to do. And we really couldn't get in there to burn. I've been trying for years to do test burns in there. The, the buckthorn especially, and then pines and other stuff. It was just too thick. You couldn't get sunlight to the ground. There really wasn't any airflow to speak of. It just never dried out. So I tried that for years to, do, to get a fire to spread you know, more than five inches. I couldn't do it. Um, the other thing was it was just too dense to get in there to do the cutting. So the reason for that is because a few years earlier, one of our volunteers, without telling anybody that he was going to go, go out and do this, went out with just a brush cutter. He cut all the invasives down, but he didn't treat the stems. So of course, what happened? Instead of coming back as a tree, it came back as a shrub. And they were close enough together, all their branches were all intertwined. You could not get in there, you couldn't walk in there, you couldn't see what you were doing, even if you could get hit in there. Um, so, with that, mm, goes. Um, the invasives, because they hadn't been cut a few years earlier, they were a good height. And there really wasn't much else in there that was going to be damaged. And it was between two heavily traveled paths, which could be used to uh, erect a fence. And it didn't impede the travel around the pond because in that area there was more than one path through there. And there's a manageable si size for all the necessary follow-up work, and there was quite a lot of that. And I honestly would not have wanted to have done a bigger area. In fact, we could have actually done follow-up in another section, and we didn't get to it. So 10 reasons, none of the other spots that we have in the Nature Center could check even half of these boxes. So it really was a good spot. But these are considerations if, if you decide you want to try to do this somewhere yourself. So here's the area. So the path that goes around the pond, this is the section over here, uh, including this dotted line. We thought that we were going to do this and the boat farmer said that would probably take 10 days because he does herds of 10. More herds of 10, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it only took a little over seven, so we actually had to move the fence over to here and let him get in here. This, by the way, is that um, outdoor auditorium. Uh, amphitheater that the teachers bring people out. Now, one picture earlier showing the Oak Hickory Woods was taken from this little old thing right here. But otherwise, you couldn't see anything through here. So we wanted to open up the view from from, from this path here, because that's very heavily traveled by kids and other people going to the school all the time. So we had, when you add in the extension here, about a fifth of an acre, and we used that information when we were ordering seeds because we needed to know how many seeds. So when they brought in the goats, they brought them in right here, opened up the fence, they came in right here, crowd started forming right here, I'll show you a picture of that. And then because the fence wasn't right up to the, uh, all the, uh, invasives that they were going to munch on. They came right down here and started munching right here and started working up and to the left. So all the crowds started gathering here over the next several days. Did you put the fence up? No, the goat farm did. So some of the preparation, this was in the summer, uh, we got the cost quote and it was only like 900 bucks. I mean, they have to feed the goats anyway, so why not? bring them somewhere and get paid to feed your goats. Um, we set up a pretty intensive education and fundraising campaign. The first thing we did was we asked the goat farm for a pictures and bios <laughs> for their goats, and they gave them to us. We put them out on our website, and that was probably the best idea we had, because that website got used a lot. Um, and we had never had online donations before, so we decided we needed to set that up, probably, put it on the same website. And uh, then we also had some signage at the site explaining what we were doing and got them heading towards that web page. 
And we also have a, about a 600 follower Facebook page and a roughly 600 person email list that we advertise to. So a lot of prep uh, up front before the boat showed up. So here's some examples of the signs. Uh, the dirt path being referenced there is the, the trail around the pond. Uh, we suggest people not touch either the fence or the goats, and we ask people to keep their dogs in check. Yes, we were putting an electric fence on the grounds of an elementary school. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> Not everybody read the signs, I'm sure, but okay. it's okay. Uh, another sign, and this was the one where we were kind of talking about what was on the website and asking people for donations. And we suggested a mere nine dollar donation and i saw a bunch of kids bugging their parents mom dad you gotta help pay for the goats <laughs> now nobody goes out there and does a nine dollar donation it's a 10 or a 20 or 25 and that's exactly what happened we we did well um so there's a qr code in the uh, website i'll show the qr code later actually you'll be able to take a picture of it and probably go there if you want to so here's an example of one of the bios. We got a nice picture, and each one had different markings, so you could actually, after a while, tell them apart. Had the name, had a little bio, had the air tag number, which was quite important, because um, that helped you figure out who was who there. Um, but we had that, you know, the same kind of information for all 10 goats. And it turns out a lot of people were reading this, and especially the kids. They had these things memorized. And there were some kids who would go around to every adult that they could find and point out their favorite goat. <laughs> and, and Ruby, actually this one's daughter, was probably the favorite of the kids because there was a little run, there's was like nine months old. So um, that was definitely a favorite. <laughs> so, oh, and, and I remember there were two girls that were I don't remember for sure, but I'm thinking they were like late elementary school. And what they did was they, they had all these things memorized, but I was watching them. They were talking to all the goats, addressing them by name. It was the cutest dang thing you've ever seen. <laughs> Which made me really glad because I was going out there like three times a day for at least an hour each time and just talking with people and listening. It, it was a lot of fun. I never got tired of watching the goats. So, the day before they arrived, the guys came out, they put up the fence, and you can see we have this nice long path. This is probably showing a third or maybe a half of the, of the area. And the nice area here for social distancing, it was great. You can see we have some white pines over here, and there's more white pines over in this area, but in front of them are some scotch pines, and there's some other trees in there. We left all of that. Uh, there's no way we're taking out but it's a bunch of trees. They're all native, they just weren't original to this site. Right here, right about where my pointer's going here, is the top of all of the mostly uh, uh, various things like buckthorn and other stuff. If that wasn't there, you would have a nice view of the pond. So that was part of our goal. And let me orient you here to some of the uh, photos and videos that I'm going to show you. So some of the videos that I'll show you, we're actually standing on a bench by that other path behind here, looking this way. And I think it was day six, and there had already been some clearing in here. You could actually see a bunch of people milling around back here. Another shot is going to be from here, looking towards the pond as we we're putting down straw after we seeded the following spring. And I'm gonna show you, I think, three shots from over here, showing the entire length of the, you know, the almost 200 feet here, and you can see all the way through it. So um, those are some of the views that you'll see here later. So the goats arrived. And they let them out. And this picture was taken, you know, they're time stamped. 20 minutes after the 
uh, goats were let out. And we do have a lot of dog walkers around the nature center, and so one of them happened to be going by, and then all the people who could get there really fast did. <laughs> and it just swelled from here. So they were, the goats were let in over here, they came through here, and then they started along this path over here. So just a couple pictures of the goats. So there's Thimble, that's the second day. You can see we do have a goldenrod in here and a few other things. So munching away. And Mandy, this is the next day. And you can see there's already a little bit of clearing. You can actually see more than about five feet through there. But let's get to the videos. So this is Diamond. And this is pretty typical. They kind of just strip the leaves off and in the process, they also get some of the ends of, of those little branches. And here's Olive and showing that the height of these things doesn't matter very much at all. They're persistent. I've actually seen them, you know, one would knock one of these things over and then the others would start eating, you know, the, the top of it, which was now down by the ground. Here's sandalwood, and this is looking towards that paved path, and you can see through there, and you can see a few people going by on some of these next couple of videos. So this is typical. Put the hoof up on a tree, you know, up on the hind leg, and just munch away. And if that doesn't work, you get your other paw up there, see if that helps. And then here's another one, and again, we're looking towards the paved path, and there are some people that are kind of wandering by in the background there at times. So again, up on, uh, this one has two paws on the tree. It actually started to bend a little bit, but didn't, didn't go down. And then this is a shot where I'm just panning this was day six, so they were still going to be in this area a little bit longer. So this is the part of the trailer on the pond. This is the side they were working on. This is the side that wasn't, obviously. But this used to look like that. So you can see some of our trees there. And there's still some stuff on the ground, but it's moderately well stripped of leaves. And again, some people in the background. So they still had about another day and a half or something like that in that area to finish up. This is uh, the area that we opened up for the last couple of days. And let me show you what that looked like after they'd been in there for a couple of days. Nothing left, <laughs> no green left. In fact, the folks from the, the goat farm brought some hay in there for them because there, there was nothing left in this area. They probably could have gone back into the other area for a little bit, uh, but this area was just as stripped as could be. And it's kind of hard to see. But I think this is that European spindle tree. It's a, a, kind of a striped green stalk. So then our work really began because they don't kill anything. <laughs> um, so there are all these stalks, but we could see what we're doing now finally. Um, so this picture is just me, but uh, the reason there's only one person in the picture is because I had a sharp implement. Um, everybody else was standing back. We actually had six people working at, at this time. So we had two teams of three. So we had two people with cutters. And what we were doing was clear maybe 10, 12 square feet and then move totally off to another spot. Second person would go in, pick up all those branches that we cut, put them in a brush pile, and then the third one would spray all the stalks, you know, at the ground level to try to kill off those. So it was a three-person crew and two of those. 
And after we got through that whole area, that's what it looked like. Uh, lots of brush piles. Many of them were fairly close to some low hanging branches from some of the trees. So we were originally thinking about burning everything here, uh, but we decided to move about half of those stems, uh, half the brush to another area to make a really nice brush pile for all the critters who, who like brush piles. Note, most of what's on the ground here are pine needles and a few pine cones. And you'd think those would have burned well, but back when I'd been trying all those years, they were just too damp, they would not burn. Now, on a clay soil like this, the air can be 30, 40, 50% relative humidity, and you'd think it'd be fine for a burn, but right at ground level, it's probably 80% humidity, and you know there's, there's still a lot of moisture and all that stuff there. Um, so when we burn the next year, um, we actually didn't get a great burn even then, even though we were getting some sunlight and we had some of the airflow through there. So after that, because we needed bare soil for the seeds to make contact with, the stuff that didn't burn, we actually raked into new piles and burned again. But here's what it looked like after that, and we're looking the whole length of this area now. You can see the whole length. Uh, the whitish areas are the ash where we had, actually had the brush piles. So you start to see a little bit of a view of the pond here. Uh, the one trail is right here. Here's the bench I was standing on for those videos. And here's the paved path. That's a pretty wide path there. Um, and then this is the following spring after we did the burning, we did the seeding, and now Jake and I, he was an EMU student uh, studying environmental studies, and he needed some uh, volunteer hours. So we put him to work. He did actually a lot of clearing for us in the area uh, back over here as well while he was working with us. But you can see a nice view of the pond here. This was taken from that path, the paved path. And you can even see the far side and you can see that there's some red bud blooming way over there. So got a nice view. And back over there, obviously no leaves, but it's the Oak Hickory Woods over on that side. So what did we put in? We put in a lot of grasses and some sedges. And the reason was we have not had good luck with grasses and sedges. We've had great luck with forbs and either the grasses don't come in very well at all or eventually the forbs take over. So we said, we're gonna do it such that we give all the grasses a chance to grow first. And uh, the first four here, they don't need to overwinter to break their dormancy, so they started growing the first year. The two sedges uh, do, did, would need to go through the next year's winter, and then they could start germinating, germinating the following spring. We actually had about 110 seeds per square foot, a million seeds, and uh, that's a pretty heavy amount, but again, we've had some bad luck with plants or with grasses, we said, we're gonna hit it hard. So that's, that's what we did. We got a recommendation from the seed supplier as to what would be a really heavy seeding rate. And they said about 100 seeds per square foot. So we said, okay, we're gonna up it even more. Um, about 600 bucks for the seeds on top of the, it was almost a thousand. Uh, there was an extra charge for moving the fence part way through. So it was close to a thousand for the uh, goats. So we're up to about 1,600. We actually made about 2,000 in our campaign. So we had some, some left over. Uh, the palm sedge was free. I got a whole pound of palm sedge seed out of my rain garden that some of you saw last summer. The following falls, so last fall and the one before, uh, I put in some other seeds and those were all stuff that I harvested from my own yard. 
And so those really hadn't come in yet. Most of those needed some overwintering as well before they broke uh, dormancy. So um, this past summer, they really were not in evidence yet. Uh, it was really all just the grasses. But that's what it looks like now. And that's looking pretty much the whole length of, the, of that area. So you can see primarily the bottle brush grass. Uh, in here, there's some, uh, the brome is in here, and there's a bunch of the, both of the wild rice are in here somewhere. Some of these did better in some areas, and others did better in other areas. So, but this area seemed to be mostly the uh, bottle brush grass. The grasses that we picked were all ones that could do well in some shade. Um, but the right hand side of this was pretty sunny, it's facing south, and that's where I put the, the other seeds when I put them in the following falls. So it really was a good success. Engagement, we had people there all the time. I was over there typically three times a day. I was never the only person watching. Even when, you know, during the week when school was in session and people were at work, there were people there. So um, there were times when there were 30, maybe it was more than 30, but at least 30 at a time. And I recognized a lot of people who were there day after day. Um, and, you know, think about the lockdown. We had gone half a year with every form of entertainment closed. Those go through real entertainment, I, I tell you. Um, and in fact, one person, and this is an absolute direct quote, word for word, he said, the way this year has been going, we needed this. Now, you don't have to have a pandemic to get some people to come watch the goats, but it didn't hurt. In terms of education, uh, the website, as well as me and others being out there talking to the people about what we were doing and why, um, we got a lot of people understanding what we were doing. Financially, we made 400 bucks above all of our expenses. Ecologically, we now have a nice area of native plants where we didn't used to. And just aesthetically, it, it looks beautiful, plus the view of the pond from that area is really nice. So it, it really worked out for us. So if you're thinking about doing that, though, be aware it takes work. So that's why this slide's up here. So I kind of broke out what was done when, what was done, and then how long it took. And it was about 230 hours. That's probably an undercount because I was trying to figure this out like two years later. And you never remember how much time you put into a project two years later. <laughs> so it could have been 300. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, there's at least 230. I, I don't want to uh, over over build the work, but uh, it, that's kind of a minimum. So after all that work that you saw um, in some of the slides, uh, I did go in there. The poison ivy came back with a vengeance. There was way more in there than I realized. Um, so I did spot spraying of those, and you know we missed some of the stock so the little ones especially just started coming back up so i went in did some spraying again i don't believe five five hours for a minute but um and then the additional seeding afterwards so i'm going to start out the q a with about three pages of them <laughs> um burning versus goatscaping if you burn, you're going to kill all the baby invasives, and you're going to top kill all the adult ones. But those will come back. You also clear the ground for putting down seed, because the seeds need bare soil to, to really do anything. Goatscaping does none of that. So if you're going to make this worthwhile, you either have to bring them back many times over several years, or you need to go in and do the type of work that we did with the cutting and, and spraying the glyphosate. But it was the best choice for this area because we couldn't burn and we couldn't go in there to cut. So why couldn't you go in to cut? It was too thick. We couldn't get in there. The, all the invasives were all 
intertwined with each other and all the leaves that were there, you couldn't see the uh, the stems to cut them or anything. So even with like a brush hog or whatever it was, no. Well, we don't, we have, little, you know, the handheld brush cutters. We don't have the big stuff. Let me digress from this presentation a little bit while I'm talking about what burning does. Because I've been thinking for a couple of years now, you know, we keep burning and the adults just keep coming back and we have to burn again. Is there some way that's effective and efficient time-wise and money-wise to kill all the buckthorn in an area? And I think I came up with it. I tried to do some researching. I couldn't find anybody who's written anything about it. I talked to Dave Mendel uh, recently and got his thoughts and he said, yeah, I think this would work. So in the spring, after all the buckthorn, and I'll use buckthorn because that's my biggest problem here. The buckthorn leaves out in the spring. It's used up a lot of energy in the roots. You burn it. So you kill the babies, you top kill the rest. You go in and seed, because you now have bare soil. And I'd recommend grass because it doesn't need another overwintering to break dormancy. It'll start growing right away that same year. And because it's a really good fuel for a few years later when you want to burn again to get rid of the babies that just re-germinated from the buckthorn seed bank. And then you wait maybe two months. Mendel told me two months would be about right. So I haven't tried this. I'm going to try it this year if I can get in some burns. Um, two months after the burn, you have all these dead stalks. So you know where it's gonna start regrowing. It's right at the base. So you go there and do a spot foliar spray. And you only have a, you know, maybe a foot diameter area to spray. It's not like you're spraying in a whole big shrub and you're getting overspray everywhere. So you do that. And then a month or so later, you figure out which ones you've missed and you do it again. And by then you've probably gotten virtually all of it. And then if you want to clean up all the dead stalks, you go in with a brush cutter and just cut the, the stalks. You don't have to do any bending down to do cutting uh, and daubing of the, of the stems. Um, the, fire, the burning doesn't take much time. It takes a little money or you do it yourself. At the Nature Center, we do both, uh, depending on the area. But I really think this is maybe even a game changer for, for us. And, and if anybody here ever tries that, you know, report back how it works. I'm going to do that uh, this summer if I can do it. Do you have a question? Yeah. What would be the fuel to burn initially? Because usually with buckler, you don't have you don't have much fuel to carry a fire. Right. And, and right now I'm thinking our old kickery woods. <laughs> or other areas that do have overstory trees. You know, we have a bunch of areas with that too. So um, our areas aren't 100% buckthorn, typically. So yeah, if you're willing to burn, or it can burn, and you have uh, a willingness to do a little spot spraying, I think that could work. So I'm gonna try it. Anyway, let's get on <laughs> with the show here. Uh, what do we do it again? As I mentioned, we had 10 good reasons why we had a really good spot. And I'll, the next best spot was maybe five of those uh, boxes got checked. So um, if we could burn, uh, we would do that instead. Um, we would do the goats if we couldn't get into an area to burn. Um, and we do have an area that is pretty low. It's actually lower than the pond itself. There's a berm in between the two. And it's pretty shady. So we've not been able to get in there and burn very often. So we might eventually do it there, but we're not sure. Was the electric fence dangerous? No, you could go right up there and grab it and hold it all day long if you wanted to. It's, it was run by two 12-volt deep cycle batteries. And uh, it just put out a little pulse eh, about every four or five seconds. And um, you know, if you ever, ever had your arm fall asleep or a leg or something like that because you were pinching a nerve or something like that, it kind of felt like that tingling. That's really all it was. But I got a story for the, about one of the dogs. Big dog, really big dog, not on the leash. Owner was right there watching. 
Dog's watching the goats, decides to watch a little closer, gets its nose up into the fence, and about three seconds later, it yelps. And it backs up about two dozen feet. It doesn't turn around and run, it backs up. I think it wants to keep its eye on whatever the heck just hit it. It sat down and it, stopped, it started watching the goats from there. It was so funny. I, I was just waiting for that to happen, and sure enough, <laughs> the guy who owned the total I got a good laugh out of it, too. Did they eat stuff we didn't want? Well, first of all, we didn't have a whole lot we, that, we weren't, that we were worried about. But they did leave their root greens alone. Um, my understanding is that if you keep it, them in an area too long, they'll start eating the bark. And that's probably not good. But if you don't let that happen, then you're fine. Um, they liked the grape leaves. They were pulling those down left and right. Um, and they absolutely loved the poison ivy. Honestly, I think they thought it was candy. <laughs> Did it smell? Um, a little bit. You could tell there was something there, but it wasn't like going to a farmyard, you know, barnyard anywhere. Um, the crowds didn't mind it one bit, and if you were there for more than five minutes, you didn't notice it anymore. And when we went in like two weeks later, um, you couldn't see any droppings, you couldn't smell anything, so it really wasn't too bad. We were a little worried about one neighbor, you know, the closest house, and they didn't complain, so I guess uh, it wasn't too bad. Timing, not that critical. Um, you have to do it after the leaf, it's leafed out because otherwise the goats don't have much to eat. But do it then and when you have time to do all the follow-up work. So, you know, we had the goats in in September. It could have been in late May, June, any time during the summer. Any of that would have worked. Could we do this without the follow-up cutting and treating of stems? Um, yeah, if you want to to take a long time. Um, I was reading something from Wisconsin DNR. It was just a, a one-page article on something that they were doing. And they said that they had a bunch of goats in an area, then they moved them to another area and, and another, and eventually they rotated them back to the original spot. And I don't know how many times they went through that loop, but it was at least twice. Because once they get rid of the leaves, the leaves come back, because all the stems are still there. They were not going to do it the following year, which will be this coming year. They're going to see how that did. My guess is it's not going to take care of it. Two times is probably not enough, especially if their invasives were pretty big, lots of roots, lots of energy in the roots. I'm sure that wasn't enough. But if you were persistent over a couple times a year, multiple years, yeah, you could do it with just the goats. Could you do the cutting and treating without the goats? Well, we couldn't in this area because we couldn't get in there. Um, besides thinning it down, um, there was also less brush to deal with later because they did eat the ends of the stems. And how do we get in touch with Twin Willow Ranch to rent their goats? So just go out to Facebook, search for them, they're out there. So here's some close-ups of three of the four things that came in those first two years. Again, this is the middle of the second growing year. Some contact information there. If you had your phone out and you zoomed in, you could probably go straight to our goat page by taking a picture of that. Uh, but anyway, any questions? Yes. The goats ate it, and then you treated it later. Mm -hmm. I mean, you burned it, and then you treated it later. So, what do you exactly treat? Because, and is it are they like? Because I've treated the buckthorn at my property. Like, unless you get it like immediately after you cut it. Okay, so it work. yeah, so the. The, the question was about kind of the order of what did we do, goats and cutting and treating. So the goats came in, and then you have time to do, you know, we went in a couple weeks later, we could have gone in several weeks later, uh, cut the stem and treated it immediately. 
So we did not have to retreat after that, other than the ones that we missed or the poison ivy, I did spot treat the following two the years. Before you did the burning? Uh, the burning was really to clear out the ground cover, all the stuff on the ground, all the pine needles and stuff. Um, by then we had already uh, done the treating, we had our brush piles and we burned some of the brush piles as we were burning the ground. Okay, so you cut and then you immediately treated. Okay. Yes, the treating was immediately after the cutting. And the goats had not gone after the, that uh, green layer on the outside yet, they were moved to a different area by then. Right, so they didn't talk kill anything because they didn't actually go and, and, and eat the the bar at all? No, the, they they didn't do anything we didn't want them to do. Uh, they they didn't eat any of the bark and all that stuff. We, we got them out of there in time. So herbicide-wise, it was just like cut, cut stump treatment? Yeah, it really was just like a cut stump treatment. Yes? Are you getting um, seedlings from the buckthorn berries? Um, Is that kind of the, we had a lot of little ones in addition to the ones that we could see to spray when we did the cutting. And so the following two summers, I went back there and I treated, spot treated those, you know, just the leaves. And they were all really small, they were at ground level. Because we cut everything, so even the small ones had to restart from the ground. So it was just a little spot treatment of anything that came back. I was just thinking that there might be berries in the soil from the years of... Um, oh, the, the, the uh, new germination. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have not seen that yet. And in fact, because it had been cut, I'll say five years earlier, something like that, um, I don't think there were that, there were no seeds on any of these plants when we brought the goats in. So it had gone half a dozen years without any of the seeds, oh, from uh, the without new seeds. From the volunteer who did the cutting? Yeah, the, vol the person who did the cutting five, six years ago, um, I think, or before that, I think had uh, pretty much uh, gotten rid of enough of it that we didn't really have any more seeds coming in. Of course, there's gonna be birds bringing more in and so on. So we do plan to burn this occasionally, you know, every, three years or something like that. We haven't done it yet. I want to give it one more growing season, really make sure everything's established and then we'll go in and burn. Because uh, we know there'll be some stuff yet in there that we want to get rid of, some babies, baby invasives. Other questions? Okay, who wants to go do goat scraping now? <laughs> Did you, have you, can you tell yet if you've gotten more volunteers or uh, it sort of help to energize more the, the Thurston Nature Center? Have we, okay, have we gotten more volunteers as a result of all the people coming? Um, maybe. <laughs> the reason I say maybe is, you know, we, we do have, uh, you know, like at least one, sometimes two work sessions each year, and we put up on Facebook and so on, and, and people do come out. I think that's been fairly consistent over the years, um, but I really needed to get more people to help with burns. So I did put out an email to the 600 people um, asking if there's anybody who could help, no experience needed, Loris <laughs> volunteered, and, and uh, there's something like 15 other people who I didn't know any of them wrote back and said, yeah, I, you know, I can maybe be there to help with that. So um, the goats may have helped with that. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's a pretty skeleton crew, though, of, of people in general. You know, there's myself and one other steward who are out there fairly often, and his son, uh, who just got out of high school. He's, he's probably out there more than we are. Um, I think that's his entertainment. And then, um, you know, a few other people now and then if we ask for help, but nobody else goes out just on their own and, and does stuff. So from this area that you said is wet, this other possible area that didn't have to check so many boxes, um, you said it's shaded, kind of DM. 
it would be something that with the goat farmers suggest like they would come in and clean that up and I mean is that something that they would yeah would so just clean right out this yeah. area if it was done it yeah so the question is about this other area that we might do that we have not been able to get in there uh, for burns because it's kind of damn we also have an issue with the fact that we're on school property we cannot burn while schools in session so it's evenings and this area is too big for an evening burn so then it's weekends and it's always raining you know so um, <laughs> we just have not been able to get in there so if we do bring the goats back it would be that area but we'd probably have to do it in sections because it's really too big of an area it's vastly bigger than this fifth of an acre is there a walkway or like a path to the pond through this um, i guess i'm not really picturing um, is this I a could, long con, or can you like walk through that to get to the Boy, it's going to take me a while to get back there, but... It's on either side of the section. The, oh. I mean, do people want to walk through it to get to the fun? So our work area was right here. So there is a path all the way around the pond. And there's a parking lot here right by the pool. And so lots of people park there and come in, or people come from the, the other side here, or, or there's a couple entrances from up here. Um, so you can enter the, the area from I mean, almost anywhere. To, do they like, let their dogs go through there? And yeah, we have, dogs, we have dog walkers all the time. I mean, is it all stomped over then, now that it's low ground? Do people just... No, nobody in the area that we did the project, you mean? Yeah. No one's been in there. I mean, other than me to treat the poison ivy stuff, but um, no, nobody's been walking through there. I, I have gotten some signs that say, please stay out, um, area you know, being revitalized, and thank you for using the paths. Mm -hmm. And it works for the most part. That if you say there's possibly poison ivy. <laughs> Actually, I, I did put up a sign right after the goats were there, and I said, poison ivy, goat droppings. <laughs> Anything else? I saw a couple of people raise their hand when I said, who wants to try this? It's, it's not that expensive, really. Does, Loris. Does your uh, goat herder uh, do this Frequently? Uh, does the goat ranch do this frequently? Yes. They, it sounds like they have at least two work crews of ten. <laughs> so yes, they do that regularly. They, they raise them for meat and for milk as well and sell that. Uh, but yeah, this, they have to feed their goats, right? So why not? <laughs> they, they eventually run out of land. <laughs> To, for, to feed them on. I told my husband if he doesn't buy me a tractor this year, I'm just getting goats. Okay. Because I'm not looking. Goats eight instead eight of a tractor. Tall, eight foot tall weeds or goats. Okay. Over here. Uh, just, just a comment. It's much better to hear about goat scaping than uh, scapegoat. <laughs> Scapegoating. Okay. Sorry. All right. I'll go along with that. And the thought that you put into the, the public display, if you will, the public involvement, and even if you didn't get a lot of volunteers, you certainly got enthusiasm from the community yeah. about what was happening. We'll answer a lot of questions. Yeah. And, and the kids and, will remember this for a yeah. Oh, yeah, the kids will definitely remember it. Yeah, probably. Yeah. They'll be coming back as adults, you know, as long as someone brings goats in. Do you remember so, yeah, and having it on an elementary school grounds and, and a middle school nearby and neighborhood, and the nature center is used a lot. Lots and lots of people walk around the pond and various other spots, with, many of them with their dogs, um, got a lot of that. Um, so it, it really is a, a neighborhood hotspot. But you use Facebook. Yeah. to promote it and uh, bringing out you know, the personalities, the profiles of the goat. And you really 
put some thought into maximizing that. Yeah, it, it did work. Thank you. So were the goats just came in for the day and then were they nope. loaded back on and left at nighttime? Were the goats there just for the day or were they left? They were there 24 hours for 10 days. And, uh, and or, they didn't, you and know, they not all of the first and the last day, but. They didn't jump over because I knew somebody no, tried, tried no. the goats and they all uh, jumped over the fence. Um, no. Uh, they didn't. I suppose they could have, but they don't. So, um, no, no, no escapes. Wow. And in fact, the guy said, we put up the fence not to keep the goats in, but to keep the dogs out. Wow, so they just stayed in that fence. Yeah, they, maybe they touched the, the electric fence once, and that's probably all it takes. Because I remember a friend of mine had goats, and man, they were jumping everywhere. Yeah, go, the goats can, they can get around. <laughs> Yeah, one more. Um, I have a couple of comments. One, um, there, um, I had a former student who used goats. He was teaching down at the University of Georgia campus. So they had whole areas of, 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 of um, uh, uh, vines and different things. And, and the central part of campus, and they they ended up calling it the Chew Crew. And it really was a huge public relations thing for engaging students on campus there to come help take care of the goats. And they had it for several months. They actually needed to, to have like a small shelter area and feed the goats or keep the goats cared for. Um, but it was a hugely successful area for, for a small stream on campus that they were trying to open up and reestablish native vegetation. And so, like, like your experience, they had to do a lot of follow-up work, but it really made a big difference in terms of opening that up. Um, two other applications that I have heard of over the years that have been pretty successful. One was um, years ago, out in California, uh, around the foothills of Berkeley, they were trying to remove the number of very flammable understory shrubs so that they could do some control guards and reduce the fire threat to um, nearby areas, and the goats were a really critical part of that. And then, um, more locally, um, I know some neighbors to some some natural areas here on the east side of Ann Arbor that routinely bring goats in to help control invasive shrubs on their property. And it seems like it's a real difference if there is a lot of other native vegetation there. They're in an area where they have a lot of understory wildflowers. And they, by timing when they bring the goats in, they're able to keep the woody plants um, down so that the, um, the native wildflowers have a chance to go through their cycle. And they claim that they bring them in about once every three years as a way of trying to keep buckthorn and honeysuckle at bay. And that seems to be kind of a reasonable management for, um, for their property. And what time of year do they do um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know for sure whether they do it. I would assume it would be in the fall when the many of the, the spring wildflowers are, are more dormant uh, that they bring it in. But um, yeah, I, I was just going to suggest probably the fall because the, the flowers and stuff that you want to keep have mostly gone through all their their growth during the summer. Uh, they're probably going to go dormant fairly soon anyway. But the buckthorn still going like crazy photosynthesizing. I'm really curious about the goat bios. Had anyone else requested that before? Was that a new request? No, it was not. Um, actually, so I can't take credit for the bios. Okay, so um, when the city did it on the city's website, I don't think they had it quite as extensive, but they had something about at least some of the goats. So it wasn't a new idea, but I think we kind of took it to the next level. And so who came up with it? The, the owner of the goats? I have no idea. Oh, I, I don't know who, who the original uh, genesis of, of the idea of putting bios for goats on websites. But the, the person who owns the goats wrote the bios? Yes, the, the ranch. It was probably, you know, either his son or his wife, I'm guessing, because they are also involved with the work, who wrote up the bios and sent the pictures. I can only imagine the kids in the school really loving it Yeah, so the, much. the kids loved it. Yeah. <laughs> you have something? Did, did the, um, the ranchers or someone 
from the farm stay with the goats at least eight percent? No, the, the ranchers did not stay. Um, they, I don't know if they came like every other day or something like that. They they dropped in right. now and then, and and as I said, they. Um, they, they actually they repaired the fence at one point, or somebody had knocked it down. It wasn't the goats, or someone tried to get through the path. And so they came in and put that back up. And I know they brought hay the, la the last day, or the day before the last day, because they were running out of leaves in, in that extended area. So, but other than that, if they came, you know, I typically didn't see them. Baseball card, okay. Yeah. Baseball card for each of them, okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right. I, I know that Jim talked about the two girls who were talking to each other, who probably would have been nine or ten if they were in late grade school. But when I was visiting, it was the four and five year olds that were talking and they knew the names of all. That's what amazed me. Yeah. So her, her comment was there's the four and five year, year olds who were also well aware of all the goats' names and which one was which. So yeah, the kids, they, they, they just ate it up. I, I manage a site that's a bit bigger than yours. Yes. And so well, about scaling up the technology. We need a couple of uh, uh, changes. We need better fencing, and we need uh, some genetic t technology. But I really think mastodons would be the area. Your area is big enough for mastodons, huh? All right. Was it mastodons or mammoths? There's a difference in what they eat. They have totally different teeth, you know. All right. Thank you, Jim.